Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Horvath, and I'm a product manager at Hacker One. Uh, today, I'm very excited to talk to you about hacker powered data, uh, specifically, why the most common vulnerabilities aren't what you think they are. Um, a bit about myself I've generally worked in the security industry for a bit of time. Um, I worked at Okta, which is an identity and access management space for four years, um, and I was the first product manager hired on at HackerOne. Uh, I'm really excited about the work that we're doing at HackerOne, and one of the things that gets me most excited <clears throat> is that we're focused on real and not theoretical security risk. So one thing that I strongly believe is that data will transform security operations, uh, even though it seems like that statement might be often overhyped. Uh, and what I mean by this is not that we necessarily need to use AI and machine learning for everything in security, um, but data can really help us in certain areas. Uh, it can help with better anomaly detection, uh, make us, help us make improvements to uh, our scanners, and help us make important decisions, um, like whether to patch a vulnerability and whether not to. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk about uh, a somewhat ancient technique involving data, uh, and that is counting. Um, counting has been around for 40,000 years, uh, and at HackerOne we've done our fair share of counting on uh, the bug bounty programs uh, that run on our platform. Uh, and we think that the data that we have is interesting or can be interesting to everybody uh, and can help us all make better decisions about risk trade-offs. Uh, before I get into those details, I'd love to learn a little bit more about everybody in the audience. So I'm gonna ask a couple of questions, and if the statement applies to you, please raise your hand. Uh, first question, does your company or project have a channel for vulnerabilities to be reported? Cool, that's pretty good. Um, how about a process for dealing with them? Okay, maybe some fewer hands. Um, how many of you know what a bug bounty program is? Everybody, most people. Uh, how many of you have one? Somewhat less. Uh, and the most exciting question, um, how many of you have ever participated as a hacker? Okay, we got a few, cool. Um, thanks, for, thanks for sharing. <laughs> uh, so it seems like most of you are familiar with bug bounty in general, and some of you have probably heard of HackerOne before, um, but here's a brief overview for anyone uh, that doesn't know. Uh, at HackerOne, we work with a community of over 500,000 ethical hackers. Uh, security teams can create either public or private programs. Um, which hackers submit real vulnerabilities to. Uh, and most of those programs will pay out uh, a bounty to reward and incentivize uh, the hacking on the platform. And those bounties can range anywhere from $50 all the way up to $100,000. Uh, so there's quite a large range. Uh, and the Node.js community actually runs two programs on HackerOne. Uh, this is the program for third-party modules, uh, and there's another program, a uh, core program, for security vulnerabilities uh, on the Node runtime. Uh, both these programs have pretty good activity from our, our hacker community, um, and they're helping to keep uh, this community uh, safe and strong. So, uh, over time, we found that companies working with hackers is less bleeding edge than it may be used to be. Uh, as you can see from the Google uh, search autocomplete results for the phrase, should hackers be, uh, two thirds of the responses are related to hackers being hired by companies um, or them being protected, uh, and only one third is related to them actually being punished by companies. Uh, this ratio was probably flipped even a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is really exciting to us at HackerOne because it means uh, that it's becoming uh, best practice in most industries uh, to listen to hackers and to work directly with white hat hackers. So HackerOne is in a pretty interesting position. Um, we have lots of cool data. Uh, we have 1,700 programs that are running on our platform. Uh, those programs have found over 140,000 valid vulnerabilities, uh, and have paid over $75 million 
and bounties to hackers uh, over the last seven years that our company has been um, in existence. Uh, and I think this is one of the most comprehensive data sets about what types of vulnerabilities hackers actually find. Uh, and when a hacker finds an issue, uh, it represents real risk. This is something that a criminal hacker could find uh, and actually exploit today. Um, on the vulnerabilities, we also have uh, some interesting metadata, like what is the skill and performance level of the particular hacker that found it, um, what uh, severity did the team assess it with, uh, what type of asset was it on, and uh, what type of industry is the program in. So uh, at HackerOne, our mission is to empower the world to build a safer internet. Uh, and we take this mission extremely seriously, uh, which is why earlier this year, we released the HackerOne Top 10 Vulns Report. Uh, and this is a list of the top weakness types uh, that are found by our hackers and are actually paid out um, bounties uh, by programs. Uh, you can access this full report today on our website, um, but I'm going to go through a lot of the highlights in the rest of my talk. So here is the HackerOne Top 10. Um, of note uh, is that companies pay out for cross-site scripting uh, far more than any other vulnerability type. Uh, it accounts for uh, over 30% or about 30% of the total bounties that are played out, paid out platform-wide. Um, some companies we know uh, are not as interested in cross-site scripting because uh, it doesn't always expose user data in mass like other vulnerability types do. Um, but from our data, it seems like it's here to stay uh, at the top of the pack. Uh, the second most uh, common is improper authentication, uh, followed by information disclosure. Uh, then we have privilege escalation, and then SQL injection and code injection. Um, the next one is number uh, at number the number eight spot, uh, SSRF. Um, we think that that's going to grow in the coming years as more and more companies um, move to the cloud. Uh, so in the rest of the talk, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into what's behind our top ten uh, and what implications that has for all of you. So uh, let's start by zooming into cross-site scripting, or XSS. Uh, as you can see here, not all cross-site scripting uh, vulns are created equal. Uh, there are a couple different types. Uh, uh, stored XSS uh, is either a higher critical severity um, over 33% of the time, whereas uh, generic cross-site scripting uh, is only uh, higher critical about 6% of the time. Uh, and accordingly, the bounties paid, the average bounty paid to those um, is pretty different. Uh, stored pays out $481 on average, while generic only pays out $288. Um, stored is harder to find, which means it only accounts for a smaller portion of the total um, cross-site scripting volumes found. I think it's about like 18% right now. So uh, why does this comparison between the different types of XSS matter? Um, I think it matters because if we look at how often a vulnerability type uh, is found, we can infer how easy it is for a hacker to discover it. Uh, and if we look at how highly a vulnerability type is actually paid out, um, we can, uh, that can imply how valuable a company sees that as being um, the tangible amount of business impact to an organization. Uh, and if we think that risk equals discoverability, times impact, uh, then we have some real world um, bug data uh, that can help us uh, as we're making risk trade-offs. So uh, in a world where security teams are low bandwidth and also embrace risk, uh, we think this data can help prioritize um, whether companies need to patch a bone um, or they can leave it, uh, or at a very minimum, what needs to be patched immediately um, and what might be able to wait a couple of days. So uh, an, another interesting thing that our platform tracks uh, are hackers' skills and performance over time. Uh, this is Pete Jaworski. Uh, he's one of the top hackers on our platform. 
uh, you can see he's got really good stats. Uh, he's a 93rd percentile signal hacker, which means he's in our top 10%. Um, and I was interested to look at uh, whether there's a difference in the types of vulnerabilities that our top hackers like Pete find um, and whether there's uh, between sort of uh, less skilled, newer, newer hackers. Is there a difference? Um, and the answer is yes, there is. There are some differences. Uh, so this shows uh, the top bounties awarded split up by our most skilled and least skilled hackers. Uh, you'll notice that for both of these groups, um, cross-site scripting pays out more bounties than any other vulnerability type. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting and surprising. Uh, the other thing to note here is that our most skilled hackers uh, tend to focus on um, pretty specialized and difficult to find vulnerabilities uh, like SSRF, uh, code injection, um, and IDOR. Uh, these typically pay out a um, lot higher bounties um, but are more difficult to find, which makes a lot of sense. So um, another thing that our report looked at were differences uh, by industry. Uh, and you can see that there are some differences. Uh, for example, aviation and aerospace uh, as a percentage sees three times uh, more SQL injections than some of the other industries shown. Um, but the general trend here is that um, we see fewer and fewer differences over time between these industries. Uh, over time, aviation and aerospace, and probably like travel and hospitality, um, look more and more like the profile for computer software. Um, and we believe this is because the world we're living in now is effectively that most companies are software companies. Uh, or at least um, we have core software parts of our products and offerings uh, that make us vulnerable in very similar ways. So um, I also looked at some trends too. Um, what is the growth or decline in weakness types uh, over time? And we started tracking this in 2017. Um, before that, our data was not as great. Um, so on the, the downtrend side are vulnerability types like violation of secure design uh, and CSRF. Um, but probably more interestingly uh, is that our top two vulnerability types, uh, cross-site scripting and information disclosure, um, those have still been on the rise the last couple of years. Um, but the highest growth uh, vuln types uh, are business logic errors, uh, IDOR, uh, SSRF um, and code injection. And uh, what these all have in common is uh, either they're associated with companies moving to the cloud, um, uh, and they're also things that humans are really good at finding and scanners are not good at finding. So uh, I've talked for a bit of time, uh, and you might have noticed that I haven't mentioned uh, the most famous and popular uh, weakness framework which is the OWASP top 10. Uh, I assume most of you have heard about the OWASP top 10 and are maybe fairly familiar with it. Uh, and right now it's sort of the security community's uh, only option. Uh, and many people sort of for better or for worse uh, consider it the list of weaknesses. Um, but there are like a lot of reasons for a list of things. Uh, and if you'll humor me for a couple of minutes, um, I'd like to talk about music. So uh, there's a very big uh, difference between an editorial list of the most popular or the best musical artists of the year uh, and the most streamed artist on Spotify. Uh, for example, at the bottom left, uh, you have Kendrick Lamar. And Kendrick Lamar received eight Grammy nominations in 2019, uh, more than any other artist, uh, but he was nowhere near the top of the Spotify streaming charts. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, Ariana Grande was the most streamed female artist in 2019 on Spotify, um, but sadly to some, uh, myself included, uh, she only received two Grammy nominations, both of which I don't think she won for. But you'll see a similarity uh, between these two lists, uh, and that is uh, Canadian and former Degrassi star Drake. 
Um, so you could say that Drake is kind of like the cross-site scripting um, of music. Uh, he's both highly acclaimed uh, and highly popular, uh, just like cross-site scripting is popular among the most skilled and least skilled hackers on our platform. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say with this uh, comparison, attempt at the comparison, uh, is that the OS top 10 uh, is an editorial list. Uh, and there are lots of good reasons, sometimes, for an editorial list. Uh, but the Hacker One Top 10 is based off of what we actually see in the real world, which makes it a little bit more akin to the top of the Spotify streaming charts. So uh, here's a comparison between uh, our two lists. You will see a lot of similarities. Um, one major difference is the relative position of cross-site scripting. So at the top of our list, kind of middle of the pack on the OWASP side. So I'm gonna dig into the, the data a little bit on our end, um, but uh, as an ethical uh, data-minded product manager, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't explain that there are some limitations in the data that we do have. Uh, the first is that there's uh, selection bias on behalf of the programs and hackers that we looked at. Um, these are all companies or organizations that have programs on Hacker One, which mean that they're probably a little bit more security conscious than your average organization. Uh, the other uh, assumption that we're making is that the types of vulnerabilities uh, that white hat hackers find uh, are the same or similar to uh, the types of vulns that black hat hackers find. Um, we think that this is probably a reasonable assumption to make, um, but wanted to call it out. So um, with those two caveats, um, I'll get into some more uh, comparisons of the data between our list and the OWASP top 10. So uh, I think this is one of the most interesting charts in the deck, uh, and it shows uh, the market share for vulnerabilities found, uh, or the discoverability of them, uh, as classified by the OWASP top 10. Uh, and what you can see here is that it shows that um, of all of our bounties that are paid out on the platform, uh, the OWASP top 10 um, has a coverage rate about 50%. Um, that's pretty good uh, when you think about it one way, uh, but thinking about it in, in another way of 50% covered means that you're 50% uncovered. Uh, if you only care about the OWASP top 10, um, that's maybe not so awesome. Uh, on the other hand, the Hacker One top 10 um, uh, matches 90% uh, of the vulnerabilities that are found um, on our platform. So this chart is the same idea, um, but instead we're looking at the share market share of bounties paid, um, not just vulnerabilities found on the platform. Uh, and here you can see that the OWASP top 10 coverage is even higher, and it's, a, it's at about 30%. Um, for the record, personally, I thought this was uh, surprisingly high coverage, which is great. Um, but again, 70% uh, covered means 30% uncovered. So how, how great really is that? Um, a couple of other things to note on this graph that are interesting uh, are even though cross-site scripting is on the rise uh, overall, its market share of bounties paid uh, is declining over time when compared to all the other options. Um, and then you'll see a little green blip uh, in 2018, uh, and that is XXE, and I will get into uh, that vulnerability type in just a couple minutes. So another question that I had was, um, what do programs pay out a lot for that's not on the OWASP top 10? Uh, those vulnerability types are CSRF, uh, SSRF, Open Redirect, and IDOR, and Conversely, um, what is in the OWASP top 10 that is much lower down on our list? Uh, and that's XXE and security misconfiguration. So I wanted to understand a little bit more about the disparity uh, specifically with XXE. So I will get into that. Um, XXE stands for External Entity Processing. Uh, and it's been uh, on the rise over the last couple of years. Uh, it's that purple line at the very bottom of the graph. Uh, it's been doubling every year since 2016. Um, 
and it's gone from pretty much nothing to uh, a little bit of something showing up on the graph. Uh, it's not an often found vulnerability, but when it is, it's almost always uh, a higher critical vulnerability uh, based off of impact. Uh, and it's our highest paid uh, bounty type on HackerOne, um, coming out to 1600 US dollars a pop. Um, a hacker has to have a lot of skill to find an XXC vuln. Um, but typically when they do, they can find it a number of places, uh, which is why we see a lot of our top most skilled hackers specializing in this type of vulnerability. Um, but it's this lack of uh, discoverability, which probably accounts for the reason why it shows up on the OS top 10, um, but doesn't show up on the Hacker One top 10. Um, and what this difference really underscores uh, is that not all vulnerabilities are created equal. Um, we typically look at things like the technical exploitability and the severity and the impact of a vuln. Um, but we also need to consider uh, its hacker discoverability. Um, just because a vuln is technically exploitable does not necessarily mean that it will actually be exploited by a criminal human hacker. Um, and what this means is that what uh, scanners find is very different uh, than what hackers find. Um, human criminals use hackers or use scanners too. Uh, so we're not saying that they're useless. Uh, they definitely have their time and place. Um, but like more generally, what's, what's the point of sharing all this information about uh, the data we have? Uh, why does it matter to you? And I think uh, it matters because uh, data can lead to better conversations with development teams. Uh, we run a survey of our customers every year and 90% of our customers said one of the most important things for them to be successful is for them to have better, uh, a better relationship with their development teams. Um, we find that uh, even if security teams know what to patch, um, they can't necessarily always get the buy-in for the development teams to work on it. Um, typically, the security development team conversations go something like this. Uh, they say, hey, you gotta patch this now, it's important, and the development team comes back with, well, you say that every time. Uh, how does this fit in with our current priorities? Uh, and what we really want to do with the data that we have uh, is to enable some mutual understanding between these teams. Uh, so the conversation goes something more like this. Uh, the security team says, hey, this vulnerability is highly exploitable by a hacker of low skill, and when exploited, it's often critical and impactful. And then the development team says something like, hey, I understand, we'll fix it today. Uh, so we hope that with this better understanding, comes ownership, and with ownership comes patching, um, if not everywhere, at least where it's most needed. Uh, thanks for listening, that's all I had. Uh, I have a couple of minutes uh, for questions, if folks have any. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> the folks that are the folks that are hackers. Do you have anything to? Oh, cool. Got it. Well, when you're done with your course, check us out. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, for companies that use uh, our, our product, um, they have, like, they can track, or even you, like, you can track what types of uh, vulnerabilities you're, you're receiving or, like, are most common. Um, and we have some details around, like, who those are typically found by. Um, so we expose some of that um, in the product to customers to, like, help them make better decisions.